On today's episode, we are talking about Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stevie Ray Vaughan was one of the best blues and rock and roll guitarists to ever live. I like to do the best music that I can, and that's, that's where my heart lies. Blues, rhythm, blues, and rock and roll. He died 34 years ago on August 27th, 1990. He was leaving a jam session with Eric Clapton's group at the Alpine Valley Resort in East Troy, Wisconsin, in a small helicopter. It was a foggy morning and the visibility was poor. We'll talk more about the details of his death later on, but I first want to explain how incredible it was for Stevie Ray Vaughan to have so many people mourning his death and celebrating his life when just seven years prior to his death, no one even knew his name. Although Stevie Ray Vaughan had a very short seven-year career, he has lived on for generations and generations and has continued to inspire guitarists everywhere. I don't think I have been to a single show where I have not seen some guitar daddy wearing a Stevie Ray Vaughan vintage t-shirt. The impact he's left on the music industry and on blues and on rock and roll cannot be disputed. Stevie was born to Martha Jean and Jimmy Vaughn on October 3rd, 1954. He was born three years after his older brother, Jimmy Jr., who was, and still is, he's 72-ish years old now, an American blues guitarist and singer based out of Austin, Texas. Growing up, Stevie would watch his older brother learning how to play the guitar and mastering his techniques. His older brother would also always bring home records after school, and the two of them really bonded over music, specifically blues and rock and roll. He's responsible for me hearing everything from Lonnie Mac, Jimi Hendrix, Buddy Guy, B.B. King, Albert King, Freddie King, Grant Green, Kenny Burrell, Wes Montgomery, I mean, we're going no, 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 no. His father had ties to the music industry himself. Stevie remembers growing up, his dad would have over his musician friends. One of the groups that was really good friends with Stevie's father were called the Texas Playboys. Stevie remembers the Texas Playboys would come over and play dominoes or cards and really just drink beer or bourbon with his dad. Obviously, while they would play cards and drink, they would also bring out their guitars and sing and jam a little bit. So Stevie and his older brother, Jimmy, were really exposed to the jam session lifestyle at a very young age. His dad would often call into the other room and say, hey Stevie, Jimmy, come on out here and show these boys what you can do. And Jimmy and Stevie would grab whatever instruments they had laying around, would come into the other room and put on a little show for their father and his friends. As a kid, Stevie absolutely loved anything cowboy. He had a cowboy blanket on his bed that he absolutely loved. He never wanted to wash it. It was always the top blanket of his bed. It had cowboys and cow cows and ropes and everything western themed. Stevie also loved to play outside. He loved recess and he loved playing with the neighborhood kids. When Stevie was seven years old, though, he broke his collarbone. And to prevent Stevie from going out and playing with all of his friends, possibly hurting his collarbone even further, his parents got him a toy guitar from Sears. It was a Roy Rogers guitar, so it had cowboy prints all over it. It matched his cowboy blanket perfectly, and Stevie always kept that guitar on his bed. He said that he would sleep with it quite often, which is a joke that he carried through his adult life. People would ask him, do you sleep with your guitars? And he would say, absolutely, when my woman is not around, I am sleeping with my guitars. <laughs> Even though Stevie was gifted this toy guitar as a means to not go out to recess, Stevie took this toy guitar very seriously. He saw it as an opportunity to be exactly like his older brother, Jimmy, who was pretty much already mastering the guitar by age 10. Stevie practiced on this toy guitar every single day. He actually taught himself how to play merely by ear listening to his brother and listening to records. By the time Stevie was nine years old, his older brother Jimmy decided it was time to gift Stevie a hand-me-down electric guitar that he had been using for a few years. For all of you guitar fanatics out there, this was a Gibson ES125T. By the time Stevie was gifted this guitar, he was already playing more than just a few basic chords. And by the way, when I say that Stevie was teaching himself how to play by ear, I mean he was literally mimicking 
licks and riffs from Jimi Hendrix, Buddy Guy, Muddy Waters. He was not just playing row, row, row your boat. <laughs> By the time Stevie Ray was 12 years old, he joined his very first band with a couple of his schoolmates. This band was called the Shantones, and the Shantones excelled at very short cover songs. <laughs> they played mostly in jamborees and backyard parties, but their repertoire was very simple and very easy. By the way, there was a very important person playing in the Shantones with Stevie Ray Vaughan. He's going to come up later in the episode. His name is Tommy Shannon, but he becomes a very important part of Stevie's life. I think in the back of Stevie's head, he always knew he was more advanced than his peers in the Shantones, but he just didn't want to leave the band yet because he wanted an opportunity to play in front of people. One day, the Shantones were playing a gig when someone requested they play Jimmy Reed's song, Tin Pan Alley. Now, Jimmy Reed was already a huge musical influence on Stevie Ray. He had already taught himself how to play multiple Jimmy Reed songs, so he was extremely disappointed when the Shantones could not play the Jimmy Reed song in its entirety. This was a pivotal moment for Stevie Ray. That is where he realized he was never going to make it with the Shantones. As Stevie Ray decided to leave the Shantones, he also decided to try out for his high school's jazz band. This was at the Justin F. Kimball High School in Oak Cliff, Texas. People in Oak Cliff are very upset that everyone says Stevie Ray Vaughan was from Dallas. They want 100% credit for being the hometown of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Technically, Oak Cliff is not a town. It was its own town until 1903 when Dallas annexed it and it became just a neighborhood of Dallas. Oak Cliff has so much pride in Stevie Ray Vaughan. It's absolutely reciprocal. Stevie Ray Vaughan was so proud of his hometown of Oak Cliff. He always wanted people to know he was from Oak Cliff, that specific area of Dallas, Texas. He and his brother, even though they were never really into school and never really into studying, they never really got straight A's or good grades, they still absolutely loved their hometown and loved their high school and junior high school. That entire community meant and still means to Jimmy Vaughn so much. In fact, in 1988, there was a reunion in Oak Cliff, Texas. Stevie Ray Vaughn and Jimmy surprised everyone by showing up unannounced. It was the cutest thing in the world. But like I said, going into high school, Stevie Ray already kind of knew that grades were not his thing. Trying out for the jazz band was the perfect opportunity for him to be involved in school while still doing what he loved. Unfortunately, Stevie Ray was immediately cut from the auditions. He didn't even stand a chance making it in the school's jazz band. And it wasn't because he wasn't a good player. In fact, he was probably one of the best players to audition for the jazz band. The problem was Stevie Ray Vaughan could not read sheet music. He had absolutely no technical skills or understandings when it came to music. Everything he had learned, he had taught himself, like I said earlier, completely by ear. Stevie was extremely disheartened that he did not make the jazz band. After being cut from the band, he enrolled in a music theory course. He figured if he took a music theory course and could master reading sheet music and understanding the technical side of things, he could try out for the jazz band again the following year and still pursue his dreams and passions of music. But soon into taking the music theory course, Stevie was extremely overwhelmed. He did not understand anything in the class. He was starting to fail the class. He never got higher than a C in music theory. <laughs> but remarkably, this did not discourage Stevie Ray whatsoever. He was really more just kind of like, F that, you know, I don't need that. So he continued to practice and to play in his own way and absorbing everything that he could in more of a hands-on matter than an academic matter. His father urged him to study more and to put more effort into his grades. Now, his father actually dropped out of school when he was 16 years old. The only difference is his dad dropped out of school because he was drafted to serve in World War II. But even though his father didn't have a high school education, he really wanted that for his boys, for Jimmy Jr. and for Stevie. From Stevie's perspective and from Jimmy Jr.'s perspective, they didn't need an education. They saw that their father did not have one and that his father was doing perfectly fine. So the boys really didn't understand why their father was pushing them to get this education. It became kind of a source of conflict 
conflict in the household because Stevie and Jimmy were constantly playing and practicing music and their father was constantly harping on them to study more. Stevie is very open about the fact that his father also had an addiction to alcohol and substances. Stevie was exposed to all of this at a very young age, so this was really just normal to Stevie. It wasn't until Stevie grew up that he realized his dad really treated him and Jimmy Jr. in ways that he probably shouldn't have treated them. Even though his dad was not perfect and had these struggles and this was kind of a toxic environment at times in the house, Stevie and Jimmy Jr. absolutely loved their dad and their mom Martha. After Stevie Ray left the Shantones while he's kind of struggling with this music theory stuff, he found a band called the Brooklyn Underground. The Brooklyn Underground was already a full-fledged band when Stevie Ray found them. They already had a singer and a guitarist and a drummer and a bass player. And I'm not sure if they were looking for a second guitarist or if Stevie Ray just kind of found them and asked, please, can I join you? It really felt like a big break, quote unquote, for him as a kid because the Brooklyn Underground was already an established band and they were already playing in local restaurants and venues in the Dallas area. So this was the first time Stevie Ray had exposure to the music scene in Dallas at such a young age. Before everyone roasts me in the comments, I will mention Stevie Ray Vaughan also had a short time with a band called the Epileptic Marshmallows. Okay, it's not like I forgot, it's just not very climactic to me. <laughs> In 1969, Jimmy Jr. dropped out of high school and decided to move to Austin, Texas to focus on his music career. Jimmy Jr. was having tremendous traction in the music industry. He was making a lot of connections. He actually got in touch with the Jimi Hendrix experience and had the opportunity to open for them in 1969. Jimi Hendrix actually broke Jimmy Vaughn's wah-wah pedal, which... I think is really funny and cool. If anyone's gonna break your wah-wah pedal, could it please be Jimi Hendrix? I would keep that broken wah-wah pedal probably forever. Jimmy Vaughn Jr., if you're watching this, can you tell us if you kept that broken Wawa pedal? But Stevie Ray is watching this go on with his brother, and he is, first of all, incredibly inspired. In a lot of ways, Stevie Ray looked at his brother and thought, if he can do it, I can do it. But in a lot of other ways, Stevie Ray also felt kind of sad and held back that he was still in Dallas, Texas as a kid with his parents while his brother was spreading his wings and doing all of these incredible things in Austin, Texas. From 1968 to 1972, he played in about 10 different bands. It might have been more than 10. Stevie Ray had good experiences in the Dallas music scene. He actually connected with a guy named Tommy Shannon in 1969, the same year that his brother was making all of these connections, ironically. And they would jam together pretty often. They really hit it off kind of as kindred spirits. Tommy Shannon was really well connected in the music industry and was playing really big shows and was a really good connection for Stevie Ray. But a couple things about staying in Dallas just didn't sit right with Stevie. Number one, in order to get a gig in Dallas, you had to be able to play every song on the top 40 list, which wasn't a problem for Stevie, but you had to be willing to only play those songs in order to keep and maintain your gig. It was very touristy. The people who were coming onto that music scene wanted to hear songs that they were familiar with. They didn't want to hear the artist's own music necessarily. Whereas in Austin, you could have a gig and play kind of whatever you wanted, songs that you had written, songs that weren't as popular, and people accepted it and liked it. So that was a big factor in Stevie wanting to leave Dallas, and obviously the other factor was being with his brother and being exposed to his brother's network. So on New Year's Eve of 1972, Stevie Ray Vaughan packed up his bags and moved to Austin, Texas full-time. Stevie didn't realize once he got to Austin, Texas, his reputation preceded him. A lot of folks in the music industry, especially those who were a couple years older than Stevie Ray, treated Stevie Ray like that little annoying bug of a little brother. Everyone knew Stevie Ray Vaughn was just Jimmy Vaughn's brother. Stevie never really said this, but people who were close to him did. They said people would often speak to Jimmy in somewhat of a condescending tone of voice. Stevie had a really hard time living in Jimmy 
Jimmy's shadow. A few years after playing the Austin music scene, it was 1975 when Stevie Ray Vaughan was playing in a nightclub when he caught the eye of someone in the audience named Johnny Winter. Johnny Winter was with another man named Cliff Antone who owned a restaurant and club in the area. Cliff Antone would also go on to open his own independent record label a couple years later. But Johnny Winter was very established in the music industry. He was a veteran, if you will, and a tremendous connection for Stevie Ray to make. Now, not only did Johnny Winter approach Stevie Ray Vaughan that night, but the two of them absolutely hit it off. Johnny Winter was one of the only people in the Austin music scene who was not condescending to Stevie Ray Vaughan. He absolutely loved his style. He did not see him as Jimmy Vaughn's little brother whatsoever, and really acknowledged Stevie Ray as his own artist, not someone who was just living in Jimmy Vaughn's shadow. Stevie Vaughn absolutely adored Johnny Winter. He was like a moth to a light when it came to Johnny. The two of them would actually remain friends throughout the entirety of Stevie Ray's life. In addition to being just a really good friend to Stevie Ray, Johnny Winter was also a really good mentor. It was 1976. He had been in Austin for a few years, had made a name for himself, had the network in place. He decided it was time to form his own band. He called it Triple Threat Review. And it featured a woman named Luann Barton on vocals. Eventually, they kind of reassembled themselves and became Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. Despite cycling through a few drummers in the 1978 timeframe because they kept randomly combusting, Stevie Ray finally settled on a core group in 1979. And more importantly, a consistent drummer who was somehow immune to randomly combusting named Chris Layton. Chris Layton would actually play drums with Stevie Ray Vaughan all the way up until his death. In the same year Stevie formed Double Trouble, he also met a woman named Lenora Bailey, who went by Lenny for short. Stevie was absolutely smitten with Lenny. They immediately started dating like a few weeks after they met. 1978 was a big year for Stevie Vaughan because he also signed his management contract with a man named Chesley Milken. Chesley was also the manager for a venue called Manor Downs, which is a horse race track, but also it was a music venue. So this was a really good manager to sign with. In 1979, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Lenny got married, and that next year in 1980, it was his very first birthday after being married to Lenny, Lenny wanted to give Stevie Ray Vaughan a really special birthday present. She went around to a couple of Stevie's friends, and they all pooled together their money. They pooled together about $350, and Lenny went down to an Austin pawn shop and bought a Stratocaster guitar. On Stevie Ray's birthday, Lenny presented him with this guitar, and Stevie Ray spent that whole night of his birthday playing his new toy. That next morning, he went into their bedroom and said, hey, Lenny, listen to this. He played a song, and Lenny said, that sounds amazing. What is that? And he said, well, I just wrote it. And she said, what are you going to call it? And he smiled at her, and he said, why, Lenny, of course. And from that day forward, that song and that Stratocaster guitar were both named Lenny. Lenny was one of Stevie Ray Vaughan's most cherished guitars, next to his very first guitar guitar, which was called number one, but Lenny had a lot of sentimental value that number one did not necessarily have, because Lenny came from his wife and his friends. After Stevie Ray died, the guitar Lenny went through a little guitar autopsy, if you will, and a couple interesting things were found. Number one, the middle pickup had been routed for a humbugging pickup. Now, nobody really thinks that Stevie Ray did that, although he might have. It could have been bought like that from the pawn shop. It was just kind of abnormal for a Stratocast to have that. And the other interesting thing, the neck had Billy F. Gibbons' name written in pencil on the back of it. They traced down the guitar maker who used to make Billy F. Gibbons' guitars. He said whenever he would make a neck for Billy, he would write his name in pencil on the back of the necks that were for him so they wouldn't get mixed up with his other clients. Upon further research, I did confirm Billy F. Gibbons, who by the way played for ZZ Top, had gifted this neck to Stevie Ray Vaughan. He gives the guitars away like crazy. And thank you, Billy. <laughs> That's a little fun piece of trivia for you. Another fun little piece of trivia for you about the guitar Lenny is that Fender actually created replicas of Lenny in early 2000, I think it was 2005 or 2007. In making those replicas, they had the same middle pickup, they had the same type of a neck. If you're into that, if you're a little guitar nerd like I am, I'll put a link in the description down below and you can go down that whole rabbit hole of Lenny and its specifications and the replicas that Fender created. Even though Stevie 
Katie's first year of marriage with Lenny was absolutely perfect, and this birthday gift was more than he ever could have bargained for. Luann and Johnny Reno decided to leave Double Trouble, and now Stevie was in a position where he needed to fill in those spots. He and Chris Layton and Chesley were not ready to disband Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble. Now, as we call it at Roots Music History, divine music intervention struck. Tommy Shannon heard through the grapevine Stevie Ray was looking for musicians to join his band. Out of the blue one day, Tommy Shannon calls Stevie and says, hey, I heard you're looking for a couple musicians. I would like to apply for a position in your band. Stevie Ray actually thought about this for quite some time because he really liked Tommy Shannon. He didn't necessarily want to get into something that could possibly tarnish that friendship, but he figured, you know what, we get along so well, absolutely. This ended up being quite a good decision for Stevie Ray Vaughan because he, Chris Layton, and Tommy Shannon all played together throughout the entirety of Stevie Ray's career up until his death in 1990. So by 1981, Stevie Ray had a core group for Double Trouble that would last for a few years. It was Stevie Ray Vaughan, obviously, on guitar and vocals, Chris Layton on drums, Tommy Shannon on bass, Reese Wynan on organ, and Johnny Copeland, who also played guitar and vocals for a while. Now, this new group thought that they were getting their big break soon after forming, when in 1981, Mick Jagger heard a tape of them playing. He called them and said he would love for them to come play a private party for the Rolling Stones. The band was ecstatic, obviously, because of the networking opportunities at this party. They immediately packed up and thought, we're going to walk away from this with some good leads. After playing the show for about two and a half hours, though, the band left a little bummed out because nobody really paid attention to them. <laughs> Everyone was really way more focused on the champagne and the food. Obviously, Chesley, as the manager, was going around trying to make conversations with people, but nothing really led to anything. The band just kind of went home and thought, okay, I guess we'll just keep playing that Austin music circuit. They went around from venue to venue in an old milk truck because they didn't have enough money for any type of a bus or a van. So an old milk truck was actually perfect. It fit all of their equipment and was fairly cheap to maintain, probably because they hardly maintained it at all. It actually had oil oil leaks and gas leaks, like everything that could be leaking on it was leaking. It's kind of a miracle they ever even made it from point A to point B at all. And then it was in 1982 when divine music intervention struck again. Luann Barton, who had been the lead vocals on Triple Threat Review, called Stevie Ray and said, hey, I'm having a label release party and I would absolutely love for Double Trouble to play it. Obviously, they said yes. First of all, they love Luann. And second of all, it's never a bad idea to play at a label <laughs> release party where all of these big time producers and big time players will be. At this party, Chesley Milken is standing next to the dance floor when he realizes legendary producer Jerry Wexler is dancing to Double Trouble and absolutely loving their music. Like any good manager would do, Chesley went up to Jerry Wexler and started a conversation with him. And he also subtly mentioned that he was the manager for the band that he seemed to enjoy so much. Jerry Wexler says to Chesley, look, I'm going to this music festival in a few months. It's in Switzerland. I know the guy who's putting together the lineup. Why don't I give him a call and see if Double Trouble could play? And Chesley was like, okay, be cool, be cool. He's like, yeah, sure, sounds good. But he was so excited. He went and he told Stevie and Chris and Tommy and they were absolutely ecstatic. Tommy Shannon had actually played this music festival a few years prior and was able to tell the other members of the band how cool it was. And Stevie and Chris Layton had never even been to Europe. So this was a big break for them. It was also also, pretty amazing Jerry Wexler got them into this lineup because Double Trouble at the time was not signed to any record label. They were actually the only act that was going to play at this music festival that had not been signed ever in the history of the music festival. Obviously, Double Trouble was anticipating that they would have a record deal in the near future, so they decided to put everything in place to record this show with video and audio. They wanted to have some live tracks for their future album, and they thought this is the perfect opportunity. It's going to be one of the biggest crowds we've ever played in. Very professional. This will be great. So they packed up their bags, got on a plane, and Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble went to Switzerland to play at the Montreux Music Festival of 1982. Upon arriving at the location, they were immediately in awe of all of the talent that was there. There was a little musician's bar that was right beneath the venue where they were playing. So they decided to go there the night before the big festival show. At that bar, they met someone named Larry Graham, who was one of the biggest bass guitarists of 
their time. They were a little starstruck to see Larry there. They also saw David Bowie. Again, a little starstruck, but play it cool, guys. Play it cool. The next day at Soundcheck, they kind of reconnected with Larry Graham. And Larry Graham is saying to them, hey, you guys are really great. I really like your equipment and everything. And they're like, wow, thanks, man. And then that night, right before the show, before anybody had really gone on and played, Larry came into their dressing room. And Larry said, listen, you guys sounded really good at Soundcheck. I would love to do the on encore with you. What do you say? And they said, yeah, that would be awesome. What, what are you thinking for an encore? He said, well, I don't know. I'm thinking like something like Johnny be good. And you know, you'll come in at this part and then you'll come in at the chorus and at this point, and he's kind of orchestrating for them exactly how he's envisioning this encore song of Johnny be good to go down. And the guys are absolutely elated. They're having the time of their life, first of all, with all of these famous people in the same room as them. And they're getting all of this exposure. And now Larry Graham of all people, People wants to play an encore with them. They were just over the moon. So they get super pumped to go up and perform. But as the show starts and the acts start going on stage, I think they were like the fourth or fifth act to go up. They noticed that everyone before them was playing very soft jazz. Softer music, I found. Music like jazz. It's music based on fear. Yeah. The fear, what, what are they so scared of? It was mainly acoustic, maybe one bass guitarist, maybe light feather drums, but it was just very soft, toned down jazz. <laughs> Obviously, Stevie Ray and Double Trouble were blues style, but also had that rock and roll vibe to them. They were ready to go on stage and turn it up to 11. You know, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're already part of the lineup. You have to go on stage and perform. At this point, you can't say, oh, we don't really fit in. You know, who's going to say that? So it becomes time for Stevie and Double Trouble to take the stage. They get on and they're introduced and everyone erupts in cheers. They're all excited to hear Stevie Ray and his band. Stevie starts the first couple of notes. And the audience goes a little quiet. Now, keep in mind, they are recording this show for their album. The entire show is actually on YouTube and I will link it in the description below. So you can go on and see the audience's reaction. They start start playing and the audience is just kind of like, oh, and they continue playing. Then they play their second song. By the middle of their second song, people in the audience were loudly booing. And you can see on Stevie's face, he's kind of thinking like, should I just stop? Should I just stop? But he kept playing. And Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton reflect on this moment later on in their lives in several interviews. And they say this is one thing they really admired about Stevie. He did not let up. They were booing and they were screaming and they had their thumbs down and possibly their middle fingers up too. But Stevie Ray Vaughan would not stop being who he was. At the end of the show, Stevie turned and looked at Tommy Shannon and said, I didn't think we were that bad. They said they were absolutely heartbroken and Stevie especially took this very, very hard. As if that wasn't bad enough, then they're walking back to their dressing room. And as they're walking to their dressing room, they had to pass a couple of the dressing rooms of the acts who had played before them. They pass one of the dressing rooms and they can hear Larry Graham in the dressing room with these other people. And Larry Graham is going, so I'm thinking like Johnny be good for the encore. And I start here and then you come in here, basically envisioning the entire encore with this other band that he had envisioned originally with Stevie and Double Trouble. And it was pretty clear Larry Graham did not want to do the encore with them anymore because they were so badly booed off the stage. They went back to their dressing room and were absolutely licking their wounds. They had no idea how it had gone so wrong. But if you remember, Jerry Wexler is the one who even got them that spot in the lineup in the first place. So Jerry really didn't realize what the mood was that night and how awkward it would be for a band like Stevie Ray and Double Trouble to come on and almost interrupt the vibe and the mood of the night. So they're kind of regrouping and in grief when someone knocks on their dressing room door. They say, come on in. And this random person comes in and says, David Bowie would like to speak to you. And they all kind of looked at each other and they were like, what? And Chris goes, David who? <laughs> and he said, David Bowie would like to speak to you. And they were like, okay, like what? Is he going to yell at us? 
for doing such a bad job. But apparently, David Bowie, while they were playing, said to one of his bandmates, Stevie Ray Vaughan was, quote, the best blues guitarist he had ever heard in his life. David Bowie was struck by Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble. David Bowie was arguably their biggest fan in that venue that night. And honestly, that's all that really mattered. All of those boos, all of those thumbs down, all of those middle fingers, None of that really mattered because they walked away from that show with one fan who mattered, and that was David Bowie. They had one more night in Switzerland before they were set to fly back to America. So they decided to go back to the musician's bar at the music venue. This next night was called A Night with Jackson Brown. There was no music festival. It was a much quieter night. After the show ends, Jackson Brown comes to the bar. As divine music intervention would have it, Jackson Brown asks them who their manager is. And they say a guy named Chesley Milken. And Jackson Brown says, Chesley Milken? Jackson Brown was like, I love Chesley. He says, listen, if you guys are one of Chesley's bands, why don't you come jam with me after the audience leaves and, you know, we'll have a few drinks and jam together for a little bit. And they were like, absolutely, that sounds fine. We don't fly out until tomorrow. So after the audience left and the bar was closing down, Jackson Brown, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and Double Trouble went up to the stage and had arguably the best jam session in music history. This jam session lasted until 5 a.m. And after it was over, Jackson Brown turned to them and said, hey, listen, I've got a studio in LA. It's just a warehouse. It's not a room you have to rent. You can come and go as you please whenever you want. Leave your equipment there. It's not a big deal. He said, whenever you're in LA and want to record, just let me know. It's all yours. And Stevie Ray and his band are just like, well, that was the most productive evening of drinks we've ever had in our lives. Stevie Ray and Double Trouble got back on the plane to fly back to America and couldn't believe their luck. They were walking away from this catastrophic show with not only a connection with David Bowie now, but also the Jackson Brown connection. They knew they had to get to LA to take advantage of this free studio time, but they only had one big problem. They could not afford to go at all. I mean, they were driving around Austin, Texas in a milk truck and they had just spent all of this money to go to Switzerland. So the band goes back to Austin, Texas and just kind of buckled down for several months. They tried to save as much money as possible and also were booking an LA tour for the fall. They figured if they could book a tour in LA, they could do several shows, make money while they were there, and also hopefully take advantage of Jackson Brown's studio. But it wasn't until November of that same year of 1982, Double Trouble flies to LA and starts doing their little quote LA tour. Once they were there in LA, once they knew they had a hotel room, once they knew they had gigs and some sort of source of income there, then they called Jackson Brown. It was just out of the blue. The week before Thanksgiving, they called Jackson Brown and they basically said, okay, we're here. Can we come in? Jackson Brown was like, you're where? And they were like, we're in LA. And he was like, it's the week before Thanksgiving. I mean, Thanksgiving, it was like maybe three or four days before Thanksgiving. He said, well, we're all going to close up shop for the holidays. And they said, well, is there any way that we could go in while everyone's gone. And Jackson thought about it and thought, actually, that might work out really well because it will be empty. You can just bring in all of your equipment. The only problem was that Jackson Brown's primary engineer was definitely not going to give up his Thanksgiving vacation for Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble. But Jackson Brown did have a secondary engineer who he assured them was just as skilled and just as good at what he did as the first guy. They said, that's fine. We don't care who our engineer is. We're just so grateful to have the studio time and to not have to pay for it. So with that, Jackson Brown sends home his staff for Thanksgiving and Stevie Ray Vaughan in Double Trouble moved in to the warehouse studio for about a week. They recorded several tracks, most of which ended up being on Texas Flood. After Thanksgiving, after they had recorded everything, the band packed up all of their things and went back to Austin, Texas. They were so grateful to Jackson Brown for this opportunity. They didn't know how they were going to repay him. So somehow they got their hands on a baby horse and they sent Jackson Brown a horse as a thank you, a two-year-old baby horse. And then just before Christmas of 1982, the phone rang at 3.30 in the morning. Chris Layton answered the phone. It was some British guy on the other side. And he was like, um, hello, I'm looking for Mr. Stevie Ray Vaughan. And Chris was like, Stevie is sleeping right now. It's 
three o'clock in the morning. Who is this? And he said, it's David Bowie. I would like for Stevie to come open for me on my upcoming tour. And then he's like, Stevie, wake up. Stevie, get up. Get up. It's David Bowie on the phone. And Stevie was like, Stevie answered the phone and agreed to be the opening act for David Bowie. Rehearsals for his tour started in early 1983. Stevie really tried to make this work, but the people who were managing the tour and the production folks, they just were harnessing in all of Stevie's goodness. You know, they were telling Stevie, play quieter, play softer, don't play that, play this, don't walk like this, walk like that. There was one instance in particular where they wanted Stevie to walk down the stairs of the stage with this fancy legwork and Stevie did not want to do that. So every time they had him practice going down the stairs, Stevie would just walk down the stairs like Stevie, you know, like nothing. They kind of realized this isn't going to work. Stevie finally said to David, look, this is not for me. This is just, it's not me. So I'm going to go back to double trouble and we're going to go back to what we were doing. Now you might be thinking Stevie Ray Vaughan just said no to what could have been the most incredible opportunity of his career. But actually by saying no to David Bowie, Stevie Ray Vaughan started catching the attention of people in the music industry who normally probably would not have even known or paid attention to who he was, even if he had opened for David Bowie. Because the fact that Stevie Ray Vaughan said no to David Bowie really raised people's eyebrows. They wanted to know who this guy was, like who in the world would say no to David Bowie? And that caused them to actually look up who he was and listen to his music with intent. Tommy Shannon was really cute about this whole moment. He said, quote, Stevie Ray chose us and the milk truck over David Bowie. It proved to be a very good business decision for Stevie Ray Vaughan to not spend his time opening for David Bowie. Because in that same quarter, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble signed with Epic Records and released Texas Flood. Texas Flood immediately took off. It was soon after that they said goodbye to their milk truck and hello to international tours and touring all around America. Everyone knowing their name, everyone clapping, nobody booing anymore. They absolutely accepted exploded in 1983. In 1984, they released their second album, which peaked at number 31 and stayed on the charts for 38 weeks. Now, by 1985, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble had definitely made a name for themselves in the top 100 charts. They decided it was time to go back to the Montreux Music Festival in Switzerland for what they said was, quote, closure. They just did not want their first and last and only experience at this music festival to be one where people were booing them. And now they thought if we go back, we're actually probably going to be well accepted. Not only did they go back, but they also recorded this 1985 show with video and audio. And if you look at these shows side by side, it is downright hilarious when they were being introduced onto the stage. The crowd was absolutely erupting in cheers. They already had two hit albums now. Right before Stevie Ray Vaughan played the very first note, Chris Layton yelled out from behind his drums, three years ago tomorrow. Stevie Ray Vaughan looked back at him and winked and smiled. Obviously, Chris Layton was referencing the 1982 show being three years ago tomorrow. By the way, if you didn't catch that. At the Montreux Music Festival in 1985, Stevie Ray and Double Trouble also played a new song called Soul to Soul. That song was going to be on their next album, also called Soul to Soul, that was released in September of 1986. Soul to Soul was met with equal enthusiasm as the first two albums, if not more, and Stevie Ray Vaughan was finally the guitar icon he always dreamed he would be. But all of this success was not as easy and as wonderful as it sounds. In fact, there were a lot of difficulties in recording the album Soul to Soul. Stevie Ray Vaughan obviously had always used substances and alcohol his entire life. He was exposed to it at a very young age from his father and just always continued to use it. He speaks to this quite often that this is the disease. The disease tells you you're okay. Oftentimes he would be out of his mind talking to someone and that person would later say, well, dude, you didn't seem that bad. And he'd think, yeah, well, I wasn't that bad. And so he would just do more and do more and do more. 
He was a functioning addict while recording Soul to Soul. And then after Soul to Soul was released, the band went on a 10-month straight tour. They were doing hundreds of shows in very short periods of time, which meant Stevie was depending on these substances to help them get the energy and the stamina to do all of these shows and to keep going. Going into early 1986, the band had zero rest time. Things were also going really badly for Stevie. Stevie and for Lenny in their marriage. Stevie was gone all of the time. They weren't connecting. Not only was he gone, but he was very rarely present in the moment. He wasn't calling her. And when he did, he wasn't asking how she was. He was distracted. He was high. He was drunk. He was busy. All the things. And it's just impossible to maintain a relationship that way. Stevie Wright and Lenny were pretty much separated by the end of 1985. And going into 1986, Stevie was just focused on the grind. He had also met a girl named Jane Anna in Switzerland, who was a Russian model and was 17 years old. So he was a few years older than Jana, but Jana was very mature and very beyond her years. Jana actually was very against all of the substances and alcohol that Stevie and the band were doing. She was continually urging them not to do these things, but she knew she couldn't control him. And it was just something that Stevie Ray kept as part of his life. The band was actually so busy on this Soul to Soul tour and so out of their minds too. They just completely forgot that they were under a contractual obligation with Epic Records to release another album. Epic Records kept knocking on their door, harping on them saying, hey, we need another album like right now. Otherwise, you are in breach of contract. So Stevie Ray Vaughan now has all of this added pressure. Now he has to put out another album. He just kind of took a bunch of live shows and put them on the album and then did a bunch of really rushed mixes and called the album Live Alive. The album Live Alive, for lack of better words, was a terrible album. And everybody knew it. They all were saying, this is complete crap. Like, what happened to Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble? This is not them. You could tell something had to be really wrong for this album to sound that bad. And obviously it was. And it was about to get worse. In the summer of 1986, Stevie Ray learned that his father's health was declining rapidly. He obviously did not have the time or the means to get back to Texas while doing all of this tour work for Soul to Soul, but it just weighed really heavy on his heart that his dad wasn't doing well at home. On August 24th, 1986, Stevie Ray Vaughan got a call that no child ever wants to get. They told him his father had collapsed and was in a hospital in Dallas, Texas, and that Stevie needed to get there as soon as possible. Stevie had a show two days later. He really didn't think he could miss, but he dropped everything and flew from New York to Texas to be with his dad. He stayed with his dad overnight on August 24th through about the middle of the day of August 26th. He thought his dad might be stable enough. He could go do the show and then come back to his dad after it was over. He said goodbye to his father and he got on a plane to go perform. Stevie Ray Vaughan woke up after that show to the news. His father had passed away while he was gone. This was really hard for Stevie. He wasn't there to say goodbye properly to his dad. That was August 27th, 1986. Not even one month later, Stevie Ray Vaughan was at a show in Germany when he came backstage after the show was over and collapsed. He was rushed to a medical center where they said he was suffering from extreme dehydration. He was then transferred to a rehab facility after they had done several tests on his stomach. Obviously, all of the substances and alcohol had caught up to Stevie Ray Vaughan, and now he was in an addiction facility trying to get clean. This was a pivotal moment in Stevie Ray's life. He did not take this lightly whatsoever. You know, sometimes people go to these rehab facilities and they just think, okay, whatever, I'll detox, I'll get out and then they relapse. But for Stevie, he took this very seriously. He did not want to die from substance abuse. He did not want to live that way, but more importantly, he did not want to die that way. And he said that over and over and over after being released from the facility, I don't want to die that way. I want to live. He really valued life. For him, the substances and the alcohol were just all he really ever knew. That's all his father ever did. That's all he was ever really exposed to. It was just normal to do 
that. And once he realized this is not normal, this is not how normal people live, he immediately wanted to change. So after just a brief period of time in a London addiction facility, which by the way was the same one where Eric Clapton went as well, Stevie Ray Vaughan left to do a show in London with a newfound outlook on life. He was actually so proud of himself for doing this London show, detoxed and clean and sober. And then just out of really dumb luck, there was a trap door on the stage that hadn't been properly secured. And completely unrelated to any type of impairment or anything at all, Stevie Ray just fell through the trap door and ended up completely lacerating his leg. He had to go back into the hospital and obviously have surgery and stitches and was back on all of these very heavy medications that he did not want to be on. And it really put him into kind of a depression. In the same time period as well, the band had all of their equipment stolen in New York City. About $14,000 worth of equipment was stolen. So this was just a really bad series of events for Stevie Ray Vaughan. Newspapers everywhere were reporting on Stevie Ray Vaughan's, quote, bad luck. There was another moment in early 1987 while all of this bad luck was going on. Stevie Ray Vaughan woke up on a tour bus in Georgia just feeling awful. He really just felt bad. He didn't want to live. Obviously, anybody would feel bad having that type of bad luck, but he also really valued his health and being clean and being sober. So he admitted himself into a Georgia facility to just kind of hit the reset button, which he did. And when he was released, he was clean and sober and in a very good state of mind. His luck at that point really started to turn around. For one thing, the police found all of his stolen equipment and charged the people who stole it. Stevie Ray Vaughan was so grateful that they found the equipment and charged these thieves. He invited the police chief and his wife to come for dinner and one of his shows. It was also in early 1987 when Stevie had this newfound outlook on life and newfound clarity. He decided it was finally time to file for divorce from Lenny. Obviously, they had been separated since 1985, but things now were going really well for Stevie Vaughn. And for him and Jana, that Russian model from Switzerland, they were still together. And not only were they still together, but Jana was a very strong force in his life and a very strong advocate for him to get clean and sober. She was really there for Stevie every step of the way while he was going through all of these low points in his life in late 1986. And Stevie now saw Jana as someone who was stable and was going to be there for the long haul. He wanted to divorce Lenny so that he could be with Jana. Stevie files for divorce from Lenny in the Texas courts, which say that the woman, when going through a divorce, is immediately entitled to 50% of that man's estate. The judge at one of the sessions asked Stevie Ray what his outlook was for the next several years. Stevie Ray told the judge that he was now clean and sober and he intended to put out another album. He told the judge, I do not want my last album to be Live Alive. I have to kind of revive myself from that horrible album. The judge decided Lenny should get 99% of the proceeds from Stevie Ray Vaughan's current estate and future proceeds from any future albums. Well, Stevie obviously thought this was enormously unfair. First of all, they had been separated since 1985. They hadn't even spoken. And second of all, even if they hadn't been, he still did not think Lenny should be getting 99% of the proceeds from his next album. Throughout 1987 and 1988, and even into 1989, it was about two and a half years, Stevie Ray held off on releasing any kind of music. He was still playing shows and he was still working on the next album, which he was going to call In Step, but he was very careful not to release anything because he did not want Lenny to get all of the proceeds. It wasn't until 1989 the divorce papers were finally signed, sealed, and delivered. C.V. Ray finally felt free to release his new album, In Step. In Step meant so much to Stevie Ray. First of all, it was the first album he had ever put out clean and sober. In every show that he was playing, 
After being released from the medical facilities, Stevie Ray would speak to how wonderful it was to not be under the control of substances and alcohol. And he also really preached to people, you can be clean and sober and be in the music industry and still be cool and still succeed and still do a good job. You don't need these substances to make it by any means. In fact, it kills you and it's going to kill your career. You might have a good run for a couple of years, but it's going to get you. The album In Step had several references to AA and to the 12-step program in the album notes and also in two of the songs, Wall of Denial and Tightrope. One of the biggest things that Stevie Ray constantly said was, In Step was finally released in June of 1989, and it was a good thing that Stevie Ray held off on releasing it until the divorce papers were finalized because after eight months of being released, Instep was certified gold. All of the press surrounding Stevie Ray Vaughan switched from Stevie Ray Vaughan's bad luck and turmoil to Stevie Ray Vaughan's epiphany and new album Instep, and it was met with a tremendous response. In late 1989, Stevie Ray Vaughan proposed to Jana, and they started dreaming about their future together. There's actually a love letter he wrote to her from the Four Seasons Stationery that was recently auctioned off for about $5,000. It's just kind of fun to see it, so I'll put a link to it in the description down below. And if by chance you are watching this and you are the person who paid $5,000 and won that auction, we want to hear from you. Tell the Roots Music History family in the comments below if you are the lucky winner of that $5,000 love letter Stevie wrote to Jana. Just one month before his death, Stevie gave an interview where he was asked about what the best part of being clean and sober was. And Stevie said the best part was that he was alive. He said that was more than he could say if he had stayed with it. Everything finally seemed to be going right for Stevie. The response from Instep was more than he ever could have imagined. And if you think about it, if Lenny hadn't been so snobby and greedy about wanting 99% of Stevie's music, we could have gotten so much more music from Stevie Ray Vaughan. If it weren't for Lenny and if it weren't for this divorce settlement holding up his release of music. And this is the part of the episode where we all start to hate Lenny. I said it. I'm not taking it back. I think that Lenny was terrible. I think she was awful to him. And she robbed us of his music because little did anyone know, but Stevie Ray Vaughan would have less than a year to live after releasing In Step. On December 8th of 1989, Stevie told the St. Louis Post, quote, before now, everything in my life was geared toward being strung out. I had tried to be positive in my lyrics in the past, but I didn't have much left to give. But I got another chance, and it's important to me to say that. He and Jana moved into a condo in Dallas, where they spent that Christmas of 1989 and New Year's making their wedding plans. In the spring of 1990, Stevie went right back to it, doing all of his gigs and shows and working on his music. But the world had absolutely no idea what was about to happen next. The events that would happen next would change the course of music history forever. I hope that you enjoyed this part one of the Stevie Ray Vaughan series. There will be a playlist on my channel called Stevie Ray Vaughan series where you can see both parts. In the next episode, we are going to deep dive into the details of the helicopter crash that killed Stevie Ray Vaughan way too soon. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you are notified when that next episode goes up. YouTube has changed its algorithm, so just because you're subscribed to somebody doesn't mean that you see their new videos on your feed once they're posted. You have to make sure you're clicking that bell icon and saying you would like to be notified of all, not just personalized. There's three options. It's like all, personalized, or none make sure you change that to all. Also, if you are listening to this on a podcasting platform, no matter what podcasting platform that is, you can hit the follow button and make sure you are following my podcast. That way, every time I post a new episode, you will be notified of it on your podcasting platform. And I will see you on part two of the Stevie Ray Vaughan series, The Details of His Death. Hungry for the road all my life Thirsty for adventure all my youth Chasing all my freedoms down Liberty Avenue